Iguanodon. The Iguanatooth was a new herbivorous dinosaur named after the resemblance that its teeth bore to those of an iguana specimen prepared by one Mr. Stochberry at the Museum of the Royal College of Surgeons. Said teeth were found in 1822. That's 200 years ago. They were described three years later in 1825 by a pioneer of paleontology known as Gideon Mantell. You can find his original description of the teeth in the link contained in the description. I found it quite interesting to read. Going on a slight tangent though, I decided to look into just which kind of iguana. There are a few species found around the world, such as the incredibly common and easily invasive green iguana, or the Godzilla-looking and deeply fascinating marine iguana. Mr. Mantell said in his paper that, quote, The skeleton from which the drawings were made is 3 feet 6 inches in length. It is said to be the common edible iguana of the West Indies, but I have not been able to ascertain its species with certainty. End quote. I'm sorry for my slurring. Ugh. The, wind, the West Indies is our key. Green iguanas are plentiful, but iguana species themselves are not. Being the early 1800s, the green iguana likely did not become an invasive species due to irresponsible, irresponsible pet owners. So the, so the only iguana species that could be found and is still native is the lesser, lesser Antillian iguana, which is an endangered species. Yay. Anyway, you're here for dinosaurs. So let's get back on that with the early reconstructions of Iguanodon. They sucked. But that's not for a lack of trying, do not get me wrong. Do recall that I said earlier that the remains of Iguanodon found in 1822? They were 200 years ago, and they were some of the earliest remains found of dinosaurs. Paleontology was still in its infancy. Not many dinosaurs were known at this time. The Bone Wars, a topic I'll definitely have to cover another time. It's so ridiculous. That hadn't even occurred yet. They didn't know jack about dinosaurs yet. They thought these animals were reptiles instead of the ancestors of birds, hence the name of dinosaur itself, meaning terrible lizard. So, they did not have the two centuries of dinosaur studies and the thousands upon thousands of specimens that we do have today. At first, due to the similarities in its teeth, it was believed that the Iguanodon was an immensely large lizard that resembled an iguana itself, but maybe a little more robust. The reconstructions were made to be quite long. Most iguanas have tails being more than half the total iguana body length, after all. Some estimates put the iguanodon at more than 50 feet long, an estimate that we now know it is rather ridiculous for the species. And then they found more remains of the animal, some of which were actually found with the initial teeth, but were believed to be that of a crocodilomorph instead, which included the iconic iguanodon thumb. But due to the disarticulation in the particular animal's death, that's the bones of an animal being manipulated and found out of place, uh, the thumb appeared to be a sort of horn. Going back naturally to the living iguana, it was decided to place the, uh, the thumb on the tip of the iguana's nose. Now, initially this makes sense, many animals today have horns on their heads, like cows, sheep, goats, and chameleons. But there lies the problem. There lies the problem, sorry. Those are animals that live today. Animals in the past had very different anatomies. 
So how did we learn that the Warna quote-unquote horn was actually a thumb spike? Well, easy. We found more specimens, and it was realized in the 1870s that the spike was a thumb, not a horn. This is why articulated skeletons are so great in any field regarding animal remains. They can immediately tell one a lot about how an animal looked. Ah, uh, you want to know what the thumb was used for? <laughs> well, good viewer, that's uh, one of the downsides of paleontology. We don't know. Could it have been used defensively? Well, possibly, but it would require the animal to get comfortably close to a predator. Perhaps in battle with another iguanodon? Sure, but we don't have any evidence for it. Oh, maybe it was used to uh, make food easier to access, like like breaking the shells of nuts or digging up vegetation. Yet again, it could be. Though we, without any evidence, it's uh, rather tricky to say yes to any of those. It could be a combination, even. So leave it up to your imaginations. We still have artic artistic liberty with this one. Now, back to reconstructions, because this is a species with a long history in this department. Now, you may recall that it was at first believed that Iguanodon was a very, very large iguana. But going into the late 1800s and early 1900s, it was realized that this animal wasn't. It was a close relative to hadrosaurs like Corythosaurus or Parasaurolophus. So scientists put the iguanodon on its hind legs and tail, a pose often called a tripod, or its resemblance to a camera tripod. Luckily, it doesn't seem to have that whole fire-breathing Parasaurolophus treatment. But then we realized that hadrosaurs were so unique yet. They weren't all the get bipeds, but quadrupeds that had the option of standing on two legs, if need be, like a bear. Uh, we also realized that dinosaurs weren't slow-moving idiot reptiles. No, they were active animals that were more akin to birds than reptiles. And that reptiles had split from dinosaurs millions of years earlier. I mean, hadrosaurs had beaks instead of teeth. Well, they still had teeth, but they had beaks as well, and their pelvis was shaped more like a bird, facing backwards instead of forwards. Okay, so now that we know what it looked like, what did it eat? Well, going back to the teeth, when we compare it to a modern iguana- what? Oh, you're getting on me for comparing a prehistoric animal to a modern one? When that previously led to the iguanodon being thought of as a lumbering lizard with a horn on its nose? No, no I, I get that. By raising the fact that teeth often evolve down similar lines when used for similar purposes. For a second, let's look at carnivore teeth. Lar large, conical, or cone shaped, backwards pointing, and sometimes serrated, yes? Now, what carnivore did I just describe? Was it a bear, a dog or wolf, a cat, a snake, a crocodile, Tyrannosaurus rex? I think you get my point. Anyway, because of the wear patterns on the teeth of a quanodon, caused by it grinding down its food to be swallowed, in the shape resembling that of modern iguanas, the guanodon likely ate leafly, leafy foliage. This also helps us tell what kind of environment it lived in. Because of its large size, being 10 meters, or about 33 feet long, not quite 50, but, you know, it, it was still big, and likely being a herd animal, the area they needed to have would be rather lush, with greenery for them to feed on and not decimate by, just by a couple individuals existing. <laughs> I think I'm about out of time, because of how deep the Iguanodon's history is compared to the animal itself. In the future, I'll have to remake this video when I finally get a paid version of uh, Melra, 
Zamora. So there's not a huge watermark. Anyway, I'm Bendu. I hope you enjoyed this iguanodon I've drawn for you. And I'll see you alongside the next terrible lizard. See ya! <laughs> oh, and uh, you can buy the iguanodon. You can buy it printed on various items in my red bubble shop, which is down below. Also, I hope you enjoyed this audio. I'm using my phone instead of a microphone, uh, which is attached to a headset. Yeah, I didn't realize it was that much of a difference, but <laughs> apparently my phone gives clearer audio. So, that's fun. <laughs> Bye.